Hi guys. Uh, so today I'm going to try to wrap up the uh, life and death um, issues under um, sex and talk about um, some of these. Um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and um, just deal with a number of these topics, one right after the other. Um, at times there will see, seem like there's very little transition. I tried to put it in a way that that would um, um, that would transition a little bit, but just beware that that um, it might feel a little choppy jumping from one topic to the next. Um, we are uh, in the um, or we just passed, I believe, the 100th anniversary of women receiving um, the right to vote. Uh, the enfranchisement of women um, to 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 vote, and women have made uh, remarkable strides. Uh, of course, uh, we are now talking about a, a a female vice president for the first time in history uh, in the United States, which is you know to tell you how anomalous we are on on the world stage. Many other nations have had uh, their top political leader be a female um, before the United States. Um, when we talk about England, uh, we could uh, we could um, uh, not the Queen, but uh, they had Margaret Thatcher, uh, and then they had um, uh, her name is escaping, but they've had another uh, woman. Uh, prime Minister. A nation like Israel had Golda Meir. Uh, Germany ha has Angela Merkel. Um, uh, even even a, a Southeast uh, nation, um, uh, oh, I want to call it Burma. It's not known as Burma anymore. Um, uh, Myanmar uh, has Aung San, San Suu Kyi. Uh, if you go down to uh, New Zealand, they of course, and many of the Scandinavian countries uh, have had women as their leaders. So uh, that's just to name a few. The U.S. then, uh, it's really unusual uh, that the U United States in its uh, approaching uh, 250 years has never had a, a female in the highest office. Um, so you know that that is, you know, uh, pretty remarkable that it's taken us this long to get uh, the second highest, um, and and um, where that uh, becomes important is is later in this lecture when we begin to talk about um, <clears throat> positions in which women should be, and we could raise the question whether. Um, <clears throat> just like someone might ask about affirmative action um, or minorities in higher ed or in other positions uh, is right, one could ask, should women be given positions uh, of authority just because they are women or should they, should they somehow have to earn it that way? But then of course is how do they earn it um, if they've never been there? Um, how can we say that a woman can do it if we've never had a woman in, a, in one of those positions? So it, it is sort of a catch-22, uh, like many of you will experience. How do you get a job without experience, but how do you get experience without a job? Uh, it's the same sort of thing for women in positions of leadership. Um, we have had, of course, a, a woman Speaker of the House, uh, but we've never had, we have still very few women in the Senate uh, in fact, the balance of, of women in those positions of power uh, in, in the Congress um, is very low. And um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked one time, uh, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And she said, when there are nine. So uh, my, my point is that uh, the U.S. is a little bit late um, as far as the rest of the world in putting women in some of the highest positions uh, in the land. But that's not the main point that I wanted to address today. 
I want to begin to get into um, uh, sexual ethics and begin to talk about some of this. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll discuss a history of marriage. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about gender identity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, polygamy versus polyamory. Um, we'll talk about pornography, prostitution, um, and the Me Too movement. So with all of that in mind, uh, let's begin with a history of marriage. And this is going to be very brief. I'm going to post something for you to look at so that you can uh, learn a little bit more about this history if you're interested in it. Um, but <clears throat> we hear sometimes that, oh, marriage has always been the norm. Well, to some extent, yes, marriage has been the norm. But it's important to remember, excuse me, that what was defined as marriage at, at times in history is not the same as what we define as marriage nowadays. So, for example, through most of history, um, it, um, marriage was not between one man and one woman. Um, it was often between one man and multiple women. And those multiple women were very often who could provide the man with, with offspring. Um, I mean, think about it. Um, evolu and from an evolutionary point of view, uh, when a man gets one woman pregnant, um, if, if he has that drive to reproduce uh, and to have offspring, then it makes perfect sense that while she's pregnant, let's get another one pregnant. Um, so that um, as soon as woman number one delivers a child, um, then we can get her pregnant again or it might even be with three wives. Of course, uh, if you go back into the history, uh, if you go back into um, uh, a lot of re re religious literature, we find that it's not unusual. And, and in as much as we can depend on those as being historical records, uh, we see um, that uh, multiple wives, um, sorry women, it was almost always multiple wives, never multiple husbands, um, has been the norm in, uh, in, in ancient Judaism. Uh, multiple wives, um, of course, has been a norm um, for um, uh, Islam. And believe it or not, there are parts of the world where multiple wives has been a norm for Christianity. Um, other religions, you know, we know that it is, we know that it has happened, but I just wanted to address uh, the more dominant Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. Uh, so in all three of those, there are history of multiple spouses, um, usually attributed to uh, or, or accredited or, or given to one man. And that is the thing. Through most of, most of history, love has not been an issue. Uh, I know that we get doughy-eyed and we think love uh, is the basis for our relationships today. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is, through most of history, love was not in the equation. Um, women were property to be transferred from, uh, usually from one family to another. Um, very often, women were exchanged as a way of maintaining peace and, uh, or, or uh, arranging for peace between warring tribes, between warring nations. Uh, it was a way for one family to gain wealth uh, and status, uh, to give their, their daughter in marriage. Um, so women really were, were chattel to be exchanged uh, for various purposes throughout history. And love had nothing to do with it. Um, you know, we, we, we probably many of you have heard about uh, arranged marriages in, in Hinduism. Well, the fact of the matter is um, that has been the norm uh, throughout much of history. In fact, uh, Queen Victoria, so just over 100 years ago, Queen Victoria of England um, had uh, a, 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 an heir of some type, child, grandchild, in virtually every nation in Europe. Uh, and that was her plan because she thought that uh, having a, a and a, a relative um, in, in, in uh, Austria, for example, or, or in, in Russia, um, 
and in England or in Germany, she thought this would bring a sense of harmony and peace. Um, and so with her multiple children, with, 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 um, with uh, uh, Albert, she thought this was, this was the panacea uh, for European peace. Of course, you know, World War I proved that not to be the case. Um, but women uh, were the primary ones who were exchanged in this way to, to try to achieve that peace. So why do we place such, such importance on marriage today? Well, if you follow the history of, of kind of marriage, so, uh, and, and we really need to trace kind of a Western understanding of marriage back to ancient Roman times. So um, as Rome had, had expanded throughout Europe, of course, we know that they went as far as the, 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 uh, the British Isles. Um, you know, as far as the, the uh, empire uh, and, and, of course, all over Europe. As, so with that expansion of, of Rome all over the Western world, um, the fledgling Christian church spread into those areas. So the, the, the church, Christian church, followed Rome um, because there was an alliance uh, you'd have to take my world religions class to understand more about this. There was an alliance uh, between the Roman Empire and Christianity at, at, one, at one early point. And so as, as Rome spread, uh, Christianity spread into those areas. Now, what eventually happened was as Christianity moved into those areas, they converted the native people uh, from their Celtic religions or their Germanic religions or whatever it was. Uh, that they were involved in, they converted them to Christianity. So when Rome began to contract at its fall, the church was then left in those areas. And whereas Rome had been a legal authority, the church was kind of left there in that vacuum as, the, as kind of the, the vestige of, of a legal authority in those places. And so as these various kingdoms, the kingdom of the Franks, uh, the, the various kingdoms that, that predated uh, the, the nation of, of, of England, of a united England, um, the various um, Germanic principalities and, and others throughout Northern Europe uh, were left with churches there. Uh, and so churches have always, at least for, for many millennia, uh, have kept records uh, of, of, of baptisms and, and births and baptisms and things like that. And so they had begun to keep records of who was, you know, which two people were united to each other, uh, who was given to whom for what purposes, um, because the church was looked on as a legal entity. In many of these, in, in in all of these places throughout throughout the Western world, uh, and so as as Rome eventually uh, disappeared from the scene uh, as a major world empire, the church was left there. And of course, we know that eventually um, the uh, Holy Roman Empire is going to rise. But let's not get into into those sorts of history right now. Uh, and so the church then began to, to um, uh, concern itself with these, with these unions between people and keeping a record of them. And slowly over time, the church began to interject itself more and more into these relationships. If we're going to be involved in these, you know, the church was reasoning, if we're involved in these relationships between uh, kings and queens, and we're doing all of all of this shuffling and and recognizing. Well, then shouldn't we be recognizing this uh, for for more ordinary people as well? Uh, and so they did. And though it took fourteen hundred years uh, from the kind of origins of Christianity, it took fourteen hundred years. It was in fourteen thirty nine at the Council of Florence that marriage was declared to be a sacrament. Now, what is a sacrament? Um, there, in, in, the, in the traditional um, Roman Catholic, um, Orthodox, and Anglican traditions, there are essentially seven sacraments. Um, 
you probably know about baptism, you probably know about uh, communion or Eucharist or, or the Mass, uh, but there's other sacraments, uh, such as the sacrament of ordination, uh, there's a sacrament of confession, uh, there's a sacrament of anointing the sick. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of the seven sacraments is the sacrament of marriage. And a sacrament is believed to be an outward sign of an inward working of God. And so the church then be began, as it be be became involved in this, in 1439, it said, we're going to formalize the fact that we believe that this is a sacrament. This is an outward sign. And for that, you need our blessing. So if you're going to be married, you need our blessing. Of course, this is around the time of the Reformation, and, and it gets a little wonky because of that. Um, uh, the European Protestants, they, they, you know, they don't necessarily want the church involved as much. Um, but you have to remember that the church is representing civil authority. Um, the church represents a civil authority in as much as it also represents a religious uh, authority during this time. Um, and, and so the two, this is why to this day uh, that you can go to a priest or a rabbi or an imam uh, to be married. Uh, you can go to any number of, of clerics to be married. Except in Pennsylvania, uh, two people can actually marry themselves. There's a loophole. I think it's also the fact in Colorado, but let's not go there. We're talking about why you go to a priest or, or, or someone like that to be married. Um, uh, it is because uh, the church had this alliance with civil authority uh, to act on its behalf. Um, truth be known, um, here's a, here's a a little tidbit for you. Um, it is, it is, uh, there are two things that happen uh, in what we know of as marriage uh, uh, today. Um, uh, and, and it is, um, uh, it is this, when a couple wants to be married, they go to the courthouse and present themselves and they make application to the state to be married. The state issues a license, but the license is not, at least in the state of New Jersey, this, the license is not valid just for that couple. They have to take it to a duly recognized authority <clears throat> who can act as an agent of the state. So when two people want to be married, there doesn't have to be the ceremony. There doesn't have to be any of that stuff. You could simply present yourself to any authority who can solemnize the rights of matrimony. That could be a justice of the peace, or that could be a priest, or your pastor, or your your. Uh, your rabbi, whoever it might be. And they then say that in their presence and in the presence of another witness or two, two people have said that they want to share all things in common. Of course, prenup is something that, you know, the person solemnizing this wouldn't necessarily have knowledge of, but nevertheless, and so then they act as an agent of the state and they sign that. Um, the reason that clergy can do that is a holdover from this medieval time um, when the church was acting in a dual status of, of, of both civil and religious. <clears throat> then there is, there, in most of us, what we expect then is the wedding ceremony. That part is unnecessary unless you want the religious blessing that accompanies the union of the two people. So there's two parts. There's the civil part, which any duly recognized person can, uh, can act as that agent to do that. You can be, you, you can get your qualifications online as far as I understand for like 50 bucks or something like that. I actually don't recommend that. It's, it's, 
yeah, I, I don't want to go into that, but I really don't recommend you doing that. Um, but, uh, you know, there's this civil authority. In the eyes of the civil authority, it doesn't matter if you have a wedding or not. It doesn't matter if you cut the cake. It doesn't matter if you do it in a church, you do it in a synagogue, you do it in a mosque. It doesn't matter to them. You do it in a temple. They don't really care. Um, as long as the, the, the duly recognized authority has signed as a witness uh, and the state then could track that person down if necessary and say, did you witness this? Yeah, I, I did. I signed that paper. Oh, okay, then they're legally married. So uh, that's all that's required. Now, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that even though marriage is, um, you know, it's far less frequent than what it used to be, um, it does confer a sense of social status and legal benefits and rights. Um, I, if, if you're in a partner relationship, there was a time when you could not just uh, walk into the ICU and say, that's my partner in there. That would not have been recognized. Now, today, we know, of course, that that is more likely to happen. But in, in earlier times, that was not the case. Um, and so, but if you say that is my husband uh, or that is my wife, uh, then certainly that carries um, a, a status with it and, and benefits with it. Uh, than just a partnered relationship does not. Um, now, with, you know, with that in mind, um, also marriage becomes a legal contract, especially in many states where things then are held in common. So for example, in New Jersey, uh, it's, it's, you know, whatever is acquired during the marriage is common to both parties. from that point forward. Um, and so it also complicates things if they decide not to be together anymore as well. Um, but the reason I'm raising this is because I, I want us to uh, move toward um, uh, a look at um, uh, same-sex marriage. But first, let me give you a little history um, of the sexual revolution in the United States. Now, I, I mentioned just a few moments ago um, the women's suffrage movement, which 100 years ago gave women the right to vote. Uh, but women were not still uh, considered to be equal in, in everything uh, as they are today. In fact, it wasn't until about 50 years ago that women could have property in their own name that Women could have, for example, credit cards in their own name, uh, which you can thank Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, for her work with the ACLU for much of that. Um, uh, but that's beside the point. Um, so even though women gained the right to vote, um, it was only in the six, well, let me back up before that. I mentioned to you last week the Kinsey Report. Uh, which came out in the 40s and 50s, uh, Alfred Kinsey, um, and how that studied the sexual uh, activities of uh, first the American male, and then it's uh, studied the sexual activities of the American female. Uh, and, and Kinsey found a lot of stuff uh, in there, uh, especially about women. Uh, but why was this revolutionary? Because we found out that men were having lots of sex. And men liked other things about sex, um, uh, not just the straight missionary positions. Um, but what kind of piqued the interest of someone like Kinsey and later uh, of someone uh, like Hugh Hefner is that it's impossible for men to have all of this sex unless they have willing partners, right? Um, uh, and so, um, uh, so Kinsey did, did this study in the 40s and found out that men were having lots of sex. With whom were they having sex? He found out when he did his study and released his study in the 50s that it was women. That there were lots of women who were enjoying sex as well. Uh, and so that, that, as that report became known and became studied, 
uh, was circulated, uh, it began to tip people off that women had uh, needs and desires as well that in some cases were not being met. Um, and that, um, you know, women were sexual creatures. Um, I, 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 I could, you know, men can't have sex with, uh, unless they're having sex with other men, but, but heterosexual men need willing partners. Um, and so that was the finding of the Kinsey Report. That was also what clued in someone like Hugh Hefner as he began to then uh, published his Playboy magazine. He wanted to do something different. Um, and as much as he was promoting a lifestyle for men, uh, a new way of being a man, uh, you weren't just concerned with being outdoors and um, working on cars and going hunting, which that was the majority of men's magazine, Popular Mechanics and Building Stream, at least uh, the way Hefner viewed it. There was Esquire, but he thought that it really didn't speak to the uh, true desire of the man um, that, that he wanted, the way that he wanted to do. And so ultimately then uh, he begins to publish Playboy, which leads to this uh, revolution in sexuality for men. But again, men need willing partners. Uh, and still, you know, the overwhelming majority of men are heterosexual. And so they need willing partners uh, who are women. Um, and so this then um, goes hand in hand with the 1960s as the women's um, movement uh, begins to gain momentum um, with people like Gloria Steinem and others. Um, and, and what they're looking for, uh, or Betty Friedan, the feminist mystique, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to look at that if, you, if you've never read it. I'm looking because I have a copy of that. Um, I don't see it right off the top of my, my shelf right there. Um, but Betty Friedan's The Feminist Mystique, um, um, uh, Gloria Steinem and her work um, with, uh, I think it was Ms. Magazine and some other exposés that she did. Um, the, the women's movement really began uh, to take off and we get, of course, the uh, sexual revolution. Interestingly enough, Hugh Hefner uh, was one of the early contributors to the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, which uh, these women were, were driving for, uh, asking that women, uh, that there be a constitutional amendment, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, that would have said that women deserve uh, to be equal to men and all things, including work pay. Now we know that women still don't get um, equal pay for equal work. Also, um, you know, it's important to, to keep in mind that it was women, other women who helped to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, majority of women um, with, uh, uh, led by, uh, to, to some extent, by a woman named, uh, by the name of Phyllis Schlafly, um, and um, concerned for, with her uh, organization, Concerned Women for America. Uh, eventually, uh, the Equal Rights Am Amendment uh, expires and is not adopted because of, because of the work of other women. But during that time, the sexual revolution was not just about women and women's rights. It was also about same-sex rights. And so in 1969, we have um, the Stonewall Uprising in New York City. You can still go to the Stonewall uh, Inn. It's, it's a tavern, it's a bar. Um, and so you can still go there. It's, uh, it was uh, made a national historic landmark, I think, by, by President Obama um, during his second term, I believe. Um, but it is, it, it's, it's where, uh, uh, at that bar, uh, frequently men would, would solicit and try to pick up other men um, for sex. Uh, there were some women there too, um, uh, and, and transgender and, and others, but, but it, was, it was a place where, where same-sex couples would often meet. But the police would go there uh, and pose as, as interested parties and they would, they would do raids and they would uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, arrest people and, and do such things as that. And finally, in 1969, I believe it was um, in June of 1969, <coughs> uh, many of them said, we've had enough of this. We're not being treated fairly. We're not going to stand for this anymore. Uh, and so they began to fight back against the police. Uh, and that, uh, that led then to another sexual revolution, which has only come to fruition within the past um, decade or so, uh, which that is the, the fight for, for same-sex rights. Uh, and that especially um, took on uh, new significance in 2014, um, when the Supreme Court ruled uh, that there could be no prohibition between uh, 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 prohibition against same-sex marriage. Now, remember, this is where I'm. I'm, I'm uh, something I was telling you a moment ago uh, becomes important right now. Remember that marriage, uh, the typical marriage, has two parts. One is necessary. One is not. The part that is necessary is the recognition of the civil authority, the state. The part that is not necessarily is the religious ceremony. That does not have to happen. And so what had happened for far too long is religious authorities had exerted their control over the civil authority saying, you can't recognize these marriages. And finally, the civil authority said, yes, we can, and we will. Uh, so it began as domestic partnerships, and eventually some states began to legalize same-sex marriage, and eventually the Supreme Court of the United States uh, legalized, they didn't legalize same-sex marriage, they said you can't discriminate uh, against people who want to be married, uh, even if they are of the same, uh, you know, same sex. Uh, and so as a result of that, um, many believe that this was the downfall of, of marriage. Well, those people who were decrying it as the downfall of marriage in Western civilization were those people on the religious side, because that's all that they could often recognize was that they were doing it and it was an act that they were doing. Truth be known, um, religious leaders do not have to perform a same-sex marriage if they don't want to. but it's not the same for a civil authority. So if a same-sex couple went to a justice of the peace and said, we want to be married, there is no legal objection that the um, justice of the peace can raise, um, excuse me, in uh, performing a same-sex marriage. Because the state has issued the license, then any recognized, uh, uh, duly appointed official then can solemnize that, uh, meaning that they can, can make it legal and binding then. But as far as the church, the synagogue, the mosque, the temple, they don't have to. They don't have to perform it. No clergy is ever compelled to perform a same-sex wedding. Uh, in, in, any, in any instance, they cannot be compelled to do that. Now, there are religious authorities who do perform those same-sex weddings. Uh, some Lutheran churches, uh, all Episcopal churches do. Uh, some Methodist churches will do it. Uh, and there are some others. There are some um, uh, rabbis who will perform same-sex weddings. I do not know of, of any other religious groups that will perform same-sex weddings. Um, that's not to say they're not out there, just I have not come across them uh, in, in my work and in my research um, in, you know, in the past few years as this has been a legal thing. But you could go, for example, to a Lutheran pastor, an Episcopal priest, uh, and you could, a same-sex couple could be, could have a wedding in a church and it could be legal. Um, but again, for example, a Roman Catholic priest 
would not in any way be compelled to perform a same-sex wedding. Because again, marriage has two parts. Two parts, the religious and the civil. The civil is absolutely necessary. The state issues the license, a duly recognized authority signs that license, such as a priest or a justice of the peace. The wedding part, so there's the marriage and the wedding. The wedding part is the part that is unnecessary uh, and is, does, is not required in any way. That's if you want that piece of it. So where same-sex marriage then becomes a, a moral issue and a cultural issue, um, social issue, is that people see it bumping up against uh, the traditional definition of marriage. But of course, the progress of women, for some people, um, you know, it bumps up against the traditional roles of women, and therefore they don't, you know, they, they, they oppose it. Um, but let's move on. Um, with the recognition, so, so, so since Stonewall and the progress that uh, same-sex rights have, 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 uh, have made, uh, we also have, uh, and it's really been within the past 10 years, that we've had a revolution in gender identity. Now, here's one area where I'm, I'm talking, and, and I have to admit to you, I don't have as much, I, I understand it from an academic point of view, it's harder for me to understand this, the topic that I'm about to go into uh, with any um, intuitive nature, and I'll explain to you why. And so there's been, a, there's been a revolution in gender identity. And uh, most, a, a lot of people will say, well, you, you know, what's, what's, what's the revolution? There's male and there's female. Well, there are biological sexes. Uh, that are male and that are female, and then there are some who are born with both genetic uh, uh, organs of male and female. Uh, we know that that does still still happen. Um, the third sex, if you will, is it sometimes referred to, um, <clears throat> but that is just biology. Um, you're you're born with with male parts, or you're born with female parts. Your gender identity is something completely different from what you're born with, the equipment you're born with. Uh, your gender identity has to do with whether you're masculine or feminine. Uh, it has to do with how you identify yourself. Uh, maybe you're gender fluid. You're not always masculine. You're not always feminine. Maybe you're non-binary, uh, so you don't fit in one category or another. Um, and then that gets into who you want to have sex with, who you feel like you should have sex with. Um, and so you can, and, and that has little to do with homosexuality. Um, uh, because a homosexual, generally speaking, they are attracted to their same sex. Uh, that's the whole purpose of, or that's the whole meaning of the term. But then you get into things like transgender or bisexual, or even someone can be gender neutral uh, so that they, they don't feel like they identify masculine, feminine, um, any at all. Um, and, and a bisexual, you know, might identify as, as male, but, but live as, uh, you know, as, as something else or transgender might have been born in one sex, but then identify as a different sex. And that's when we get into gender reassignment surgery to make the outside match what the inside feels. Um, the reason this is so difficult for me to understand sometimes, and, I, and I, I readily admit this in my classes when I get to this point, of all the other topics we'll, we, you know, we'll discuss, I, you know, I, I, I feel like I have some intuitive natural understanding of this. The reason uh, I have difficulty with it is because I am, I fit in the category of what's called uh, cis-normative male. Um, 
it means that I completely identify um, with the sex and the gender that I was assigned at birth. Um, I am a male, this is the last time I checked, um, and uh, I'm, generally I'm masculine, although as I understand gender terms a little bit better, uh, I think I am probably a little bit uh, more toward the feminine on this spectrum. So whereas, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm masculine in most ways, uh, there are tendencies that I have, uh, things that I, that I appreciate and things that, that sort of feed my spirit that would be identified very often much more as feminine. In fact, um, you know, my wife and I uh, will very often um, joke about the fact because she is a um, cis normative female uh, and she tends to skew uh, toward the masculine, uh, even though she's feminine in every way. Um, uh, and so we, we sort of are a good pair in, in, in that sense um, that, that she has sensibilities that are at times that are very masculine I have sensibilities at times um, that are very feminine. Um, and and it, it, that doesn't uh, make me effeminate uh, in any way. It doesn't make her uh, masculine in any way. Um, it just means that, that our identities, uh, our gender identities, are, are, are generally what we were assigned, at, you know, match the sex that we were assigned at birth, although we do have some uh, traits, if you will, that um, are, are a little bit more obscure. Um, I'm going to put, put a, um, um, an article up for you to look at this. Uh, it, it's from uh, Healthline, and it's 64 terms that describe gender identity and expression. I'm not going to test you on it, but if it, this is something that confuses you, I would encourage you to take some time to look at that. Now, uh, moving along from that, I, I mentioned with whom do you have uh, have sex, um, and you know that being one of the identities uh, that we're talking about here, which leads me uh, into a discussion about um, how many people with whom you have sex. Uh, and this is still somewhat of a controversial um, issue uh, in the United States today. Uh, the United States is still a, a largely conservative country. Um, uh, and that has to do with the topic of polygamy versus polyamory. Um, Polygamy uh, used to be thought of as something that, uh, that only the Mormons did. In fact, Mormons were persecuted uh, because of their polygamous lifestyles. And in, in fact, they did at one point, uh, the Mormon Church, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, they did at one point outlaw polygamy. But again, remember that in the history of marriage, you know, we have a, humanity has a longer history of being polygamist than we do uh, of, of being uh, one man, one woman. Um, uh, and so uh, keep that in mind that, you know, it was, uh, polygamy was outlawed. Now there are some groups who still do live polygamist uh, lifestyles uh, and they are generally Mormon and they are generally in the American Southwest, although not exclusively. Um, nowadays, couples can live rather openly in what they would call polygamous lifestyles. However, um, I don't believe there's any state in the union that recognizes uh, polygamy where, where one person can legally marry multiple partners. And that's how polygamy is defined. One person 
marries more than one partner. I do believe in all 50 states, it is still illegal to do that, uh, to marry more than one partner. Uh, and I do believe you can be prosecuted uh, if you're found, and that would be called bigamy, uh, if you're found to have more than one, one husband or wife uh, living at, the, at that time. Um, but there are people who live uh, as though they were um, in a polygamous uh, relationship. Uh, there's even television programs about my sister wives or something like that. Uh, I believe I've never watched it, but I've, I've heard about it um, before. But then there is the other side of that called polyamory. Um, polyamory also tends to um, connote relationships, um, but it is multiple people in sexual relationships with each other. The, the typical polygamist relationship is one man, multiple women. A polyamorous relationship can be a relationship where there is more than one man and more than one woman, uh, and they are all in relationships with each other so that the men may have sex with each other, the women may have sex with each other, and then the men and women might um, um, have sex with each other. Um, hell, for all I know, in, in orgy fashion sometimes. Might be all four of them uh, or more uh, at, at any given time. Um, but generally, again, they're, they're not married. Uh, in this relationship. Uh, and again, these sexual partnerships are interchangeable. They are, um, you know, it, it, is, it is not just one man and multiple women as, as usually is, is polygamy. Um, I've known people in polyamorous relationships. Um, I, I've known it twice. Um, I know one situation where it seemed to work for them. Uh, I know another situation where I don't think anybody was really happy. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, just uh, and, and I will post something uh, for you to look at about this. Uh, and this is not to be confused with an open relationship, in which case a man uh, and woman or two men or two women um, might be married with each other, but they might have an understanding uh, that they have, that they're allowed to have sex with other people, but that wouldn't necessarily be polyamorous in that <clears throat> all the people with whom they're having sex are not in the same relationship, um, at least as I understand it uh, as of right now. Um, so uh, continuing then with, uh, with some of these, and you can see, I think, some of the obvious um, um, moral, social issues with a relationship like that. Uh, in our culture, it just would not be acceptable, generally speaking. Not to say that it's not increasingly more acceptable, um, but just historically, that has been a problem for Americans to kind of swallow. Um, then I want to uh, bring us to uh, pornography and um, just say a thing or two about uh, pornography. Um, um, pornography is actually something that is very hard to define. Uh, um, I forget which, which um, Supreme Court justice um, said it, um, but he said uh, something to the effect, I, I can't tell you what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. And there was a Supreme Court case where Playboy was taken to court and um, um, uh, Playboy was ruled not to be pornography. It was not pornographic. Um, however, Hustler uh, magazine was uh, ruled to be pornographic. <clears throat> now, if you look at those two magazines at one particular 
time in their history. In the early 70s, there was a period what was called the pubic wars, where they both were competing to see um, uh, to see who could expose um, women the most and get away with it. And I do mean expose women uh, to the greatest extent and get away with it. Uh, Hugh Hefner eventually called it off and said, I'm not going to keep getting into this competition. Um, he had a different understanding of what his magazine was trying to do. But of course, pornography nowadays is, is so readily acceptable. Um, pick up your phone uh, and, and you all know, you can, you can find porn um, quicker, as quick as you can find the weather um, nowadays. Um, we know that that, that that is out there. Uh, and so the question is, is there any harm in pornography itself? Um, I've seen studies go both ways uh, to suggest that there is harm um, for viewing pornography, that it does desensitize, um, especially men, because men are, are, are generally the, the larger consumer of, of pornography. Interestingly enough, I think uh, we also find that people in the Bible Belt are larger consumers of pornography than uh, people in other parts of the country. So the Deep South <clears throat> tends to consume more porn than like the Northeast of New England and places like that. Um, but I've also seen studies to say that, that there is no harm, no long-term harm. Um, I might post a couple of things about that for you. I, I don't know. I, I leave that for something for you to, uh, to think about um, and for you to do your own, make your own judgments about. But you can certainly see where it becomes a, um, a, an issue for people, um, whether or not um, pornography is a, is a problem. Um, I think some areas where it could be problematic um, is if, for example, if one partner in a relationship wanted to introduce porn and the other partner didn't, um, there it could be detrimental to the relationship. Or if um, one partner um, viewed porn um, to the exclusion of uh, having a sexual relationship with a partner um, or so that they could not perform or did not want to perform <clears throat> with their, with their uh, ordinary sexual partner. Of course, that could be problematic. Um, but by, by far, the, um, uh, the uh, couple of areas uh, of porn that I think are uh, most troubling uh, are revenge porn and deep fakes. Now, revenge porn, in fact, there are laws that are, that are coming onto the books now about revenge porn. Uh, here's what I would just caution you, just to be honest with you. Excuse me. Um, if you don't want it on the internet, don't take your clothes off and let somebody take photos of you, pure and simple. Because uh, we know that photos and, and movies, images can be stolen nowadays very easily. Um, so even if it's not revenge, it can be stolen and, and, and posted to the internet. Uh, but of course there is the revenge porn is typically when someone does do a consenting video or photos and um, the relationship ends and those um, videos or, or images are then uploaded to the internet. And let's face it, <clears throat> you all know this as well as I do. Once they're out there, they are forever out there. There is no taking them back. Um, I know a young woman um, who 
when she was 18 or 19, she let a boyfriend take those photos. Um, he posted those photos and she can never get those photos back. They are out there. Um, she will tell you she knows where to find them right now uh, on websites, multiple websites. Um, so it's just a reality. Uh, if you don't want it on the internet, then don't take your clothes off, men or women, and let someone take photos of you. Don't have sex on camera. Just don't do it. Um, the other issue is deep fakes. Uh, and this happens with celebrities, but this also, there have been court cases of this happening with, with average ordinary people. And deep fakes are where you take someone's face uh, and you impose it up on, on an image of other people having sex. And they are so well done today, it is almost impossible to distinguish a deep fake from uh, the real thing. Um, that is something that you cannot, um, you cannot prevent if someone made a deep fake of you. Uh, the only recourse someone might have um, is uh, in the courts if, if a deep fake is discovered. But revenge porn is something that you can prevent. <clears throat> that leads me to uh, one of the, uh, not one of the, it's one of the final things that, that I want to bring up and that is prostitution. Uh, to my knowledge, the only state in the U.S. where it is legal is in parts of Nevada. Um, there, in fact, there are a few years there were, uh, there was even um, a program on about, um, I forget, it was about the Bunny Ranch out in, in somewhere in Nevada. Um, but prostitution is something that is not legal in the rest of the United States. Uh, and the question has to be, why not? Um, uh, I do think that, you know, it, it, it is questionable whether or not it should be legal. Um, it, is, it is a commodity that women have. Sorry to, for, you know, to speak of women in that way, but it is something that they have that men want. And it is a way that some women uh, could choose to make a living. Uh, and beyond that, uh, just the, the economic side of it, uh, if prostitution were legalized, <clears throat> then it could make, be made safer for women. And for that matter, uh, well, I guess there are male prostitutes as well. I shouldn't be so sexist and insane that way. <clears throat> but it would also be safer for the customers I mean, put it in that way. That way I'm putting it in gender neutral terms, but we know it's mostly women in prostitution. Um, it could be made safer for um, the customers because uh, those who are selling sex uh, could uh, be tested for disease and for other things. They could also be protected from abuse and exploitation. Um, if we do believe that a person's body is, uh, that a person is autonomous over their own body, they do have authority over their own body, uh, it, it, it confuses me why we would not allow a person then to sell their body um, as, a, uh, as a commodity, um, especially when there is, a, there is a desire for it. Now, finally, um, uh, I want to just quickly look at uh, the Me Too movement and sexual harassment. <clears throat> Not so much Me Too, I, I guess I should say, as sexual harassment, because that's what we're talking about when we talk about the Me Too movement. Um, we're talking about women being sexually harassed. Of course, we all know um, the, uh, the case of Harvey Weinstein uh, and what happened uh, with him. You followed that in the news a couple of years ago. But sexual harassment um, technically is defined in, uh, in a couple of different ways, in three different ways. <clears throat> First of all, it is verbal, written, physical, or visual conduct, dirty jokes, comments about appearance, accusations, whistling, rumors, stories, touching, grabbing, assault, gestures, sexually related objects, or pictures. 
Um, I, I think of the movie, oh God, it's, it's probably 40 years old now, close to it, but Dolly Parton and Lily Tomlin and I forget who else was, uh, Jane Fonda, was she in it? Uh, the movie Nine to Five. And uh, the boss in that is a perfect, such a <clears throat> stereotypical example of a sexual harasser. But let's not kid ourselves. We live in a, in a world where men can be sexually harassed too. Uh, in fact, there was a Fox News correspondent, uh, Kimberly Gil Gilfoyle, who quit and, and Fox News paid a huge settlement because she was accused, credibly accused, <clears throat> of sexually harassing uh, some of her male colleagues. Uh, and so sexual harassment can run both ways, although it usually is men, of course, sexually harassing women, but it's defined as verbal, written, physical, or visual conduct, um, dirty jokes, comments about appearance, accusations, whistling, rumors, stories, touching, grabbing, uh, assault, gestures, sexual related objects or pictures. So that is one definition of it. The second definition of it, it is a verb, it is a request for a sexual favor. Um, so for example, um, if, um, if, uh, if, if I said um, to someone in the class, um, do you want an A? I'll tell you how you can get an A. You can do this. <clears throat> you know, if you do this for me, I will give you an A. That would be a, a clear uh, example of sexual harassment. <clears throat> it could be your boss saying, if you want to raise, uh, you'll do this. Or if you want a better working condition, then you do this. If you want a promotion, you do this. Uh, any of that um, is sexual harassment, a request for a sexual favor. Um, and in that case, I guess we would call it um, a quid pro quo. If you do this, I will do that. Um, it can also be an unsolicited or unwelcome sexual advance. And this is where it gets very difficult, uh, I think, sometimes to try to um, delineate what is um, sexual harassment. <clears throat> I would say if you can avoid um, dating in your workplace, um, do it um, because it, it is just fraught with um, with problems uh, if it is if it is unwanted or misunderstood. So I would say definitely avoid that uh, if you at all possibly can. So you can see where that would be uh, a, a, a social issue uh, to be um, uh, to be avoided. Um, um, of course, I, you know, that is to say nothing of something like cyber sex, sexual harassment, uh, which is actually a, a thing nowadays. The final point, and it's, it's been a long lecture, it's been about an hour. So the final point I want to make uh, is this. The sexual act cannot be immoral simply because it is sex. The sexual act cannot be immoral simply because it is sex. It is a biological drive and an urge. However, however, it can be immoral if it violates another person in terms of their autonomy, in terms of their consent, in terms of beneficence, <clears throat> or any of the other terms that we have studied. So a sexual act, just because it is sex, is not immoral. Um, but, uh, it can be immoral if it violates an ethical principle of autonomy, consent, beneficence, or any of those sorts of things. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and I think I laid out um, to you 
uh, before uh, some points to think about having moral sex. Um, you know, what do I want sex to mean? Um, what does my partner want? Um, um, how do I understand sex? How does my partner understand sex? <clears throat> and what do I want um, the, you know, the sex to mean? Am I showing uh, respect for myself and my partner? Am I choosing to have sex or am I being coerced? So with these, uh, I'm gonna uh, stop there. Guys, have a good day.